Uh, it's with great pride I come and speak again. Um, some, I'm sure m many of you were here last year uh, when I spoke last time. And um, I remember last time I wrote loads of notes very carefully and I didn't follow any of them. Um, <clears throat> but tonight I just have to say a uh, real great thanks to the Communist Party um, and the, the fantastic work you've been doing. And over the last year our relationship has, I think has developed more. Uh, you've attended a, a number of our events. Um, we've been in more contact. We recently had a, uh, a, deli um, <coughs> a member of the PIGC, which is the uh, Revolutionary Party in, um, <coughs> sorry, in uh, Guinea-Bissau, West Africa. A representative from their organisation came over here recently, a sister Teodora Gomez, and you did an interview with her and helped make the, the, her trip one of the many different organisations she met to see the vibrance and what's been going on in this country. But also what it demonstrates is the importance of a fantastic presentation that was made and also the, the great poem about the unity of peoples, the unity of interest. And we at the All African People's Revolutionary Party are very, very clear about this question, the question of unity of interest. It's not a question of colour. Although we have a very clear nation class analysis, we recognise that Africa and African people, we're oppressed as a nation, but we also understand we're also oppressed as a class because the interests in the African continent and around the world. It's quite clear, for example, Obama represents the imperial class, represents the bourgeoisie, represents a different class to the majority of African Americans in the United States. So we're very clear, and once we say nation class, we're also very clear about the importance of the class struggle, and we make absolute clarity about this issue. And we know racism is a major issue in the nation class, and the, 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 the nation oppression is a very big issue, but we recognize that fundamentally unity amongst the class struggle is an essential component of, the, of winning the revolution. <laughs> Just in terms of my experience, of course, we meet uh, a wide range of different forces on, on, on the journey of struggle. And, uh, of course, we get critiqued from different angles, just like yourselves. You get critiqued from a whole range of people. We know the normal forces, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about the more friendly forces, but maybe sometimes a bit confused. And in my background, I had a history of work at the trade union movement. And in terms of my more formal organising, I was a trade union organiser back in the 1980s uh, at Brent Council, and in what was then NALGO, then became Unison. And I was a, a local organiser, then became a... Then you, you know what happens is you start off by just volunteering to be a sort of local shop steward, and then you end up being on some sort of committee, then you start representing the whole of Brent, then you're on staff side, the next thing you're at regional, the next thing you're at national conference, and so on and so on. Uh, and this is how a lot of us, are, because of the basic belief that we need to fight against injustice, we get involved in these struggles. But it gave me a great sense, what that history gave me was a great sense of solidarity between the working class uh, of different peoples around the world. It gave me exposure to the international solidarity messages at National Conference of people in China, Nicaragua, at that time South America was a big issue and Central America was a big issue at that time. And the solidarity messages between peoples of the world. It showed me the, that that unity was real in practice and it was something that we could, we could do in practice. It also exposed me to some other issues around, of course, the role of the Soviet Union at the time, but not so much specifically about that, though I'll come to that in a second. But what it exposed me to is also some of the contradictions in that. Because then when we started to organise black workers, there was contradictions there. There was people saying, no, we don't want to organise black workers, we need to be all one. And we said, yeah, but even within the unit there's issues. People are not being represented and so on, so we organised black workers as well. But what it also showed was the unity between Asian and African peoples. And why I say some of these comments about sometimes being critiqued is that people make comments to you sometimes. You get these little comments in your ear. Oh, you can't unify with Asian people because they're not, they shouldn't work with Africans. And they don't know nothing of the history of the relationship, the fantastic relationship between the Asian and the African communities in this country and the long history of struggle against racism in this country. They know nothing of the long history of struggle between the white working class and African and immigrant populations to fight against injustice. We, yes, we know about the other aspect of the history, which is racism and so on and so on, but we can't look at history by just looking at it from the view of the, the winners, of the, the people who, the bourgeoisie or, the, or, or, or the, the, a certain class interest that protects history in a very simplistic way and doesn't show the complexity of society and to show that there's solidarity in many, many ways fighting struggles. And it's easy to critique it from outside when you're not involved 
in struggle. When you're involved in struggle, you see the reality. And that's why I'm so happy when I had the invitation that it was in my diary immediately, I would always come along to an event like this. We're very proud to be here. A, a little bit about the Soviet Union, and I don't propose to be an expert by any means, and it was a fantastic presentation, I really enjoyed that actually, about the Soviet Union, because last time I spent time talking about how I came into the struggle, and I didn't come into, I, I read, the first time I read anything on Marx and Lenin, I must have been in the organisation, I don't know how many years, but many, many years before I read anything, any book by Marx or, or Lenin, um, <laughs> but read so many books on socialism by so many other writers, and, 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 and particularly African writers, and some of them I'll mention shortly, but what is clear is that the revolution and the Soviet Union, uh, or the Russian Revolution as it was at first, brought amazing things to the world. It brought fantastic change. Well, obviously, it frightened to death the imperial nations of the world. It absolutely frightened the life out of them. Because then they realized that if they didn't introduce the welfare state in Europe, and they didn't introduce and have so many other reforms that the end was nigh. That the working class, the ripples of the working class would have gone through Europe, America, and the whole world would have been taken over by socialist revolutions. That's absolutely clear. And the working class were bought off in a sense, as well as a, a level of ideological confusion, but, but largely bought off by a lot of the arguments and the, the things that people wanted. Some of those gains were made in the so-called 20th century because of the struggle of the working class. And I make it no apology for keep on saying that I think the 20th century was a century of socialism. And the reason why I say that is because I think all the basic social struggles, in terms of the basic argument and the outcomes that were achieved by the struggle of the masses and the working classes and the peasants of the world, were achieved through left struggles, socialist struggles, communist parties and so on. All of the basic arguments, have, most of the basic arguments have been one. The one I'll come to a bit later is the one of economics. And even with economics, we've got loads of examples which were mentioned earlier about the achievements of places like the Soviet Union. We know the achievements in Cuba, DPRK. We know the achievements of socialist countries in terms of economics anyway. But we still have some ground in terms of convincing people about the merits of socialism or communism and making them understand of how economic, economic theory and practice can actually change the society and improve the conditions of the people. But certainly the contribution of the Soviet Union was massive because... By having the Soviet Union meant that it made a massive contribution to the anti-colonial struggle. Because now there was an alternative vision, there was an alternative. There was people who had challenged the prevailing um, population, to challenge the ruling classes, and had created something different, developed industrialization, and had solidarity with working class peoples around the world. Showed that Europeans, and in the European uh, country, would be in solidarity with the anti-colonial nations around the world. So these are the kind of contributions that were made that are very, very important. The ideological alternative can never be underestimated, and I think you eloquently explained the whole issue of ideology. There's no revolution without ideology. We're absolutely clear about the same thing. We say our ideology is in Krumerism and Therese, which comes from the two of the great Pan-Africanist leaders in, in the African Revolution. And ideology is absolutely crucial, and also the importance of study. You know. Uh, 23 years in organization and studying for most of the, virtually every two weeks for that 23 years. And it's very, very important. In our organization, you can't have membership unless you study. If you don't study, you get thrown out. It's as simple as that. Study is the work study process, is the fundamental uh, organizational unit of the organization. Because if you're going to develop the soldiers, as you, you put it, or the cadres of the organization, as you said, if you're going to do surgery on, on, on your mother or your father, love alone. It's not really going to work. And there's lots of sentiment in po politics. Love alone isn't going to work. If I said, you know, my mother's dying of, of, of some disease, and I said, well, I'll do the operation because I'm her son, and I just do it out of love, people will say you're mad. Let's do it. We don't even care if somebody hates her, but at least let them have the skill to be able to do the surgery. And the, the thing is, with politics, is exactly the same, as you elo eloquently argued. How do we change society? How do we do this? It's a scientific process. There's a scientific process that we can do. Yes, there's evolution. There's been an evolutionary process where human society has developed over the years. But that's been terribly interrupted by classes of people who have interrupted the evolution of society. Those collective societies we see in every society in the world. We see evidence of collective societies in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in the Arab world. We see history of collectivism. That was brutally interrupted by ruling classes through wars, through all sorts of reasons. We know all the history of that, but they've all been brutally interrupted. So now, evolution won't work. We now have to be organized and we have scientific methods. And of course, the great contribution to the world is the methodologies and ideology of Marxist-Leninism. There's absolutely no doubt about that.
revolution, we've made a contribution to developing this further in, in the context of the African revolution, which is to deal with some of the other contradictions that we feel also needed to be dealt with, which is the decolonization of the mind of the African people, for example, and some of the, the, the other constructions of philosophy, the basic philosophical basis of the educational systems in, in places like Africa, had to be challenged and, trans, and transformed. And understanding that the culture of the people is also very, very important and should be uh, consolidated and put up there as very, very important. If you travel around Africa today, you see people abandoning their culture everywhere. You know, people will, all you need is to put TV or satellite TV into an area, into a village or wherever, a bit of electricity, put a little bit of electricity in as you develop places in Africa, Asia and around the world. And then people start to have, of course, have uh, satellite television. And within a few years, people stop eating all the food that's around them for free. All the food that's around them, whether it's um, animals, whether it's fruits on the tree, whether it's veg vegetables or whatever. People no longer want that. They then want Kellogg's cornflakes for breakfast. <laughs> because they think that that's more modern, it's more westernized, and it's more something that we should be adopting. So people abandoning their culture around the world, chasing these these material gains because the TV stations are telling you that this is the modern concept and a whole lot of confusion around that. We see in places like South Korea, we have the highest percentage in the world of plastic surgery. What's that about? Of just confusion, just because South Koreans are dominated by Western information. Although they, they, their so-called GDP is very high, the, the, the mental state of the people is not well developed. So materially they, they may be developed, but mentally there's something wrong. A denial of their own culture and their own reality. So this is some of the issues that we need to deal with. And this ideological struggle is very, very important. And that is the role, as you correctly said, of the revolutionary parties, that ideological transformation is crucial. As you said, we can go on a march, nothing wrong with marches, we go on marches all the time. We can protest about cuts and so on. But if we don't fundamentally get people to understand what's the fundamental basis, that these are just fires. We talk about this all the time, we use these analogies that the imperialism and capitalism create fires for us. It's death in police custody yesterday, tomorrow it's unemployment, the t another day it's globalisation, another day it's, it's the pension scheme. But they're fires that are being fought, not that we shouldn't be struggling, because the working class and the peasants around the world develop strength in solidarity and strength politically by winning some of those battles. We understand that. You know, if you win the battle against pensions, then people think, oh, this politics works. Maybe I should get more involved in political organisation. But we must always remind them and be honest to them that that's not a solution. If the government climbs down over the pension issue over the next few weeks, does that end the contradiction between capital and labour? It doesn't. It just creates a small reform where workers can just have a basic pension that's being secured. But it doesn't transform the fact that the average pension in the public sector is less than 10,000 a year. How do people live on 10,000 a year? So even if you achieve the best package you could possibly agree, you're still going to live in indignity in, 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 a, in old old age. And can you afford your bills? Can you pay the electricity bill and gas bill? Why are they still in private hands? Why are they not being subsidised? And why are we so-called using the market to just say, well, if you can't afford it, you just have your electricity cut off, or you just freeze to death, as you rightfully said. So these issues we have to bring to the struggles to show people that the ideological component of it and understanding the basis of the system is not changing, even though it's reformed. And we see these reforms. Cameron comes in this sort of Kieran conservatism they talk about, like Bush talked about. Kieran conservatism with bombs. You know, that's the, that's the kind of Kieran conservatism we talk about in Libya, isn't it? You come there to save lives. When Cuba goes to a country to save lives, they send 10,000 doctors. When imperialism goes to a country, Um, to deal with, uh, to, to assist and help people is to send bombs to people, bombs on the top of their heads to uh, help liberate them. The other con small contribution I wanted to make, I just wanted to mention a little bit about some of the African revolutionaries who, who have been out there, who have lost their lives as a result of challenging imperialism. And as you said, we have examples all over the world that in the African revolution or in the African struggles, we've had examples of people who... Maybe some of them were embraced by the system until they crossed certain lines. As you said, they can ask for reforms. They can ask for the vote. They can ask for fair wages. They can ask for employment rights. And the system has no contradiction. They'll meet you, they'll have public meetings, they'll shake your hand in public, no problem. Martin Luther King is the person I'm thinking about as an example. 
But when Martin Luther King decided to say he won't study war no more, it meant he came in direct conflict with imperialism. Because now he was saying the war in Vietnam was wrong. He was not just saying, you know, that blacks in the South weren't getting the vote or in the North weren't getting the vote, people couldn't register for vote, we should have equality and so on. He was no longer saying that. He was now saying that American imperialism is a problem. When he started to talk privately, and these, all these information has come out because we got the FBI files and all the rest of it, he was taped all the time. But where he, he started to question whether he could continue to lead his people into non-violent marches where they were being massacred in the street and beaten and, and, and brutalized. He said he was finding it more and more difficult to morally justify having a principle, which we say is an error, you never have a principle of non-violence, you only have a, it's a tactic. Non-violence is a tactic. And that's a He made it a principle, which was, er was one of the errors, but nevertheless he was correct in the sense that, that the African American and the civil rights struggle was not ready to take America by force. Mm -hmm. So while I do agree, and this is one of the things I did when I, I had a job where I had to go on the tube, I decided what am I going to read, I'm going to start to do some reading, make use of this time, as you said, we got to study, and I had this book, Why We Can't Wait, it was the smallest book I could find, because I thought reading on the tube may be a bit difficult, so I got that book, and I had a tremendous more respect for Martin Luther King as a result of reading the book. And as you rightfully said, if we don't read and study, we can have misconceptions about our own leaders and our own people. And that book said why we can't wait. And he did justify why nonviolence was the right approach. And he said if we took up arms, we'd be massacred. And I think he was correct in the analysis of that time that clearly there wasn't a strong enough resistance to say you were going to take it to an arm level to defeat America by arms in that con context. But nevertheless, some of those things, as I said, he was then assassinated only when he started to unite with white working class. When he had the march in Chicago, that changed the war game. Because now he was dealing with working class struggle against the, the industrial uh, companies. And now he was becoming dangerous. Civil rights, that's fine. That doesn't, that doesn't deal with the fundamental contradiction of labor and capital. But when you start dealing with workers and organizing workers against the industrial class, and saying that we don't want war in Vietnam, you're dealing with imperialism now, and now you have to go. Malcolm X, when Malcolm X was going around America saying white people are the devils, he wasn't assassinated. When he stopped saying white people are the devils and we need to unite with anybody who's going to work with us, when he said that we need to look at the nations around the world, China and other places in the world, Cuba and so on, and look that they're turning to socialism, and he started to say we need to unite between African Americans and Africans in Africa, he, funny enough, was assassinated. But he wasn't assassinated, or his life wasn't threatened when he was going around saying white devils and he was saying some of these things, we need to open businesses, and when he was giving that argument. But when he changed his argument and he threatened imperialism and said imperialism is the main problem, and he used language like capitalism is the bloodthirsty uh, system, he then came in direct confrontation with the system as well. When Chris Haney, some of you, I'm sure you remember Chris Haney. Yeah, I remember very well. Yeah, Chris Haney. When Chris Haney was advised, God knows why, he was advised to move into some other area in South Africa for his, uh, you know, when it looked like there was going to be some negotiations and peace was going to be agreed and this confusion took place and then he moved into area. Funny enough, he died when he was one of the leading forces amongst the Africans in the ANC saying that we needed transformation of the system. Reform and ending apartheid was not enough. We needed a total transformation of the system. And funny enough, by the time of the elections, he, funny enough, was, was murdered. And we see this repeated throughout history. So Bukwe, leader of the Pan-Africanist the Pan -Africanist Congress, which we also criticise. I mean, one of the things we stand by also by communist parties and the right communist parties as well, as <laughs> rightfully said, is stand by you with the right analysis. Because you stood firm on the issue of Ivory Coast and Libya, when others have wavered and had all kinds of confusing messages. <laughs> with the situation in South Africa back in the 80s and the 90s where we had to raise some concerns with many of the so-called white left of saying that you had unconditional support for the ANC and we said that's a contradiction. I said either you're for the masses or you're not for the masses. Why are you, why are you taking this sectarian approach of only supporting the ANC? Why don't you support all the freedom organisations that were all fighting for the liberation of the country? Why are you aligning yourself specifically with the ANC? And the anti-apartheid movement, we were very critical of them for that reason. But City AA took a more principled position. 
a, a much younger group of people, mostly based in London. Some of you probably have heard of them. The City AA took a much more principled position and supported all the freedom struggles in South Africa and took a much more principled position. And so we support you in when you take the correct positions in these places and don't take a sectarian position that that kind of like a, a biased position that seems to support only people who don't really want to change the system. They just want to get rid of some small contradictions, which is apartheid. It's just a small contradiction, but it isn't really the major issue. <clears throat> There's many, many Africans in the United States and in South Africa who can drink at the same fountain as a white person. But that means you can, you can also die on the same street as, a, as the same poor white person that's sitting next to you. And we, equality or poverty is not the outcome that we're looking for in socialism. <laughs> uneducated in the United States now. You can also be equally uninsured in healthcare. You can be equally die of, 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 of simple diseases that could, could be dealt with or, or have your leg cut off because you haven't been able to see a doctor early enough or your teeth pulled out because you haven't had the, uh, you haven't had the opportunity to go to a dentist because you just can't afford it so you just lose your teeth. And we see this in poor countries around the world that the major cause of disability is war and lack of primary healthcare. It's not because uh, you know, just because people are, are, are just ac having accidents at work or something. It's basically <coughs> poverty and, the, and a bad system. I just wanted to touch on a, a few other e examples. As I said, Kwame Toure, Cabral, people who died in mysterious circumstances. Cabral, of course, was assassinated. Samora and myself, these people who just fall out of planes. You know, we have all these reactionary African leaders around the world. None of them fall out of a plane. <laughs> Simora Michelle goes on a journey, falls out of a plane. Uh, we have peace in Sudan, and suddenly the co-president or the vice, one of the first vice presidents, John Perrin, uh goes in a plane, and within a few weeks, the plane falls out of the sky. We also see Rosie Douglas, for example, perfectly healthy, Opposition party in exile in Canada for many years, then he comes back to Dominica, wins an election. Rosie Douglas has a long history of, of support for socialist struggles, Libya and so on. And within a few weeks of him becoming the Prime Minister of Dominica, funny enough, he just drops dead for no, no explained reason and nobody ever gave a proper reason. We also see leaders in other places around the world, like in Haiti, where President John Bertrand Aristide, fine when he was pu pu pushing for equality, when he was work fighting for the working class, some of the liberation theology, the American, the American imperialism, and American president didn't have too much problems with it. But when he demanded that French repay the reparations that France had been demanding for all those years, they realized this man had to go. And funny enough, they said that he needed to be rescued. You know, uh, he needed to be rescued. So you get a helicopter, go into the country, take the president out to be rescued. But funny enough, he can't come back. So you rescue him. But he has to leave and live in exile for seven years, and he's only just returned recently. Because, of course, when he confronted the question of labor and capital, that's when he had to go. We also see in Ivory Coast, we're not saying Bagbo by any stretch of the imagination, President uh, Laurent Bagbo by any stretch of the imagination wasn't a socialist, wasn't a revolutionary. But again, when he said, we need to renegotiate the agreement between France, and the, and the Francophone nations, which gives France a guarantee that all the resources in the so-called Francophone West African nations go to France for virtually a, 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 a drop in the ocean, virtually nothing. The same kind of agreement that they made with Haiti. Again, funny enough, we had NATO troops, we had uh, Sarkozy flying in and removing a president uh, from office. We had the same situation, of course, with Libya. Exactly the same situation. What happened there? Why? You know, many of our, our, our people are confused about this question and unfortunately, too many of the left in this country have taken the wrong position on Libya. Whatever the contradictions of the Gaddafi government, whatever the contradictions of the Jamaria, the contradiction of where he stood in imperialism wasn't one of them. So his position on Zionist Israel was absolutely clear. The position on the Palestinians was absolutely clear. His position on socialism was absolutely clear. His position and support for the Republican movement was absolutely clear. His, his, his support for women was absolutely clear. He, he was accused of being mad, the mad dog they called him, the mad dog of the Arab world. Why? Because he made a commitment to say, I will house everybody in the country before my parents. And you call him mad for saying that? When you have rich presidents around the world who house all their family in palaces, in massive buildings, and all their family and relatives and friends have all got big buildings where we have thousands and millions of people living homeless in, this, in the country, and you have another president who says, I will house everybody in the country with good accommodation before my parents, and you call him mad? 
It's an, it's an amazing thing. It's a bit like what they used to say when, as I said, when you call for e equality and you say give somebody who's starving bread, they say you're a, you're a saint. But if you say why do they need the bread or why are they starving, they call you a communist. <laughs> you're not allowed to challenge the reasons for the revolution. But in, in closing, I just wanted to, not controversy, but I wanted to raise some points with you because we're amongst friends. And when I'm amongst friends, I like to raise some issues that we can, we can raise in-house. Because we make these public declarations, as you said, a brilliant speech, and what we need to do in terms of the transformation and building the party. And hopefully we can help, and we'll work together over the next however many years. Many, many years, I hope we have a long, long relationship in building our organisations and working together, and doing more of these joint work. I'm, 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 to arrange some sort of uh, a seminar or a public meeting again on some of these key issues in the new year and we'd love to do that particularly on Libya and other and other issues but I wanted to say that there's also some challenges for us on the left that we have to deal with I think internally and when I say internally I mean in the sense that we must never waver on the question of what the real contradiction is we're absolutely clear about that but with amongst friends we see some of the reforms going on in Cuba for example and it creates some challenges that I think that we we have to address because we can't deal with the world that we ideally want. We have to deal with the world we inherit and the world we have at the moment. And it's quite an interesting question. That, so the cardinal principles that I've always been taught around socialism and communism is the ownership of private property. And we see the, with the, the struggles in, in, in socialist countries how there have been discussions and reforms around the question of private ownership. And is it an absolute principle that there should be no private ownership or is it a question of how private ownership is, is owned? Is it okay for somebody to own a home to live in, for example, that they can use as a capital resource to gain some funds? Is it okay for the poverty, somebody poor in India, to use a bit of collateral of their land, a tribal leader in Africa or so on, to say, yes, you can use this land and you can get a loan on the back of the land and maybe get a wheelbarrow and do some basic things to help the peasants? There's some questions about how, how we interpret some of these things, and I think they're interesting kind of debates what was happening in Cuba, because it's the masses in Cuba that raised this issue about owning their own homes and, and whether they could be used as a capital resource. And these are serious questions that we socialists need to, to look at. Also, agricultural reform. We see all the way around the socialist world, we saw mass uh, nationalization of land. And in terms of agricultural production, went through the roof. There's no doubt about it, production went up massively. But there's also serious problems. There's been famines, there's been serious issues around motivation. And this whole thing that, that Shay talk, taught us about moral um, incentives over material incentives and that whole question of what happens if year after year people are working and the material incentive is not the main incentive, the moral incentive, how long does that last? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? And these are real issues that we have to grapple with on the left. And in an ideal world, maybe we don't have to deal with any of these contradictions, but I think we have to debate them and we have the benefit of hindsight. If it's the 94th anniversary, we have virtually 100 years of hindsight to say what was written then, but what can we interpret about the world as it is today? Even in the African Revolution, we see the same, some of these hard issues we need to deal with. That all the advice was taken, that we talked about since the 1945 5th Pan-African Congress, that was in England, by the way, that was, that was organized when they said, go to Africa and organize mass organizations to overthrow the, 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 the systems. And that's what they did. And what we saw was we see the MPLA in Angola, we see the Free Limo in Mozambique, we see SWAPO, in, um, in, in Namibia, we see the ANC, well the ANC was already formed, but we see the formation of the PAC, ZAPO in South Africa. We see so many different organizations, the PIGC in Guinea-Bissau, the PDG in, in Guinea-Conakry. We see all these mass organizations being formed under Marxist-Leninist um, leadership or socialist leanings, whether they were called Marxist-Leninist or not. But most of them were. But what we see today is some serious concerns about whether these, whether these political parties are still true to what they once said. Some of these organisations even gone public and said they've constitutionally changed and said we're no longer, you know, the kind of Blair moment. Although the Labour Party was never really socialist, as Tony Benn always said. There was always socialists in it, but it was never a socialist party. But, but these serious changes, it's changing the landscape. And now we have to deal with this kind of post-colonial period. A post-colonial period where you have these mass parties who are still mass in numbers, but in their interests are beginning to be questionable as to whether these mass parties are still really, are they really implementing socialism? Or are they just moving into a sort of free market reforms, 
and basically just implementing capitalist free market neoliberalism. And we now have a, to grapple with this and say that those of us in the left, may, do we unite with those traditional parties? Or do we, do we seek out the most progressive elements in those organisations and work with them? Because one of the mistakes we, we could argue we've made is we abandon some of these organisations as soon as we think, well, they're a bit wishy-washy, they're a bit reformist, so we just say we're not, we don't want nothing to do with them anymore. But actually, some of the most progressive forces within them are still struggling within them to try and get the party back in. And what we've done is help isolate them by saying that we wash our hands of them. And maybe if we had kept the relationship with some of those more progressive forces, we could have helped them maybe take a more progressive position. I don't know. This is all for debate. And these are some of the real debates that are going on in, the, in different struggles around the world that we need to grapple with the question of strategy and tactics of how we take things forward. And the, the role of social movements we've seen in South America the role of social movements is a very interesting change. Because it was written that we have political parties, the vanguard party, we organize the people, political education, all what you said is all correct. But we see in South America there was an interesting, there's been an interesting route to move to socialist governments. I'm not saying it's correct, but it's an interesting route we need to look at. What is the role of the political party, the communist and socialist parties, alongside these social movements? Because the danger is what you have, if you look at Cuba, the Cuban Revolution happened. Where was the Socialist and Communist parties? We see many of the revolutions around the world where the Socialist party said, you're too early, you're going too soon. This contradiction that we have of maybe purism, maybe the purism, you're not going the right route. But there isn't necessarily a right route to power. Um, when the working class have an opportunity to get power, if it's the ballot or the bullet, if they do it through the ballot and they can get change, people will go with whatever they can go with. But is it wrong? And then how does the political parties that haven't been part of that process then come into that coalition of forces to make sure that ideology is correct. So I just think there's these are real challenges that we need to think about. And hopefully we can have some of these, you have your study groups and we have ours, we can have some of these geopolitical debates that will really help crystallize us. We recently had some meetings in Ghana and, um, and in North America where we had some of these debates internally. It'd be really interesting to share and discuss with yourselves <coughs> about some of these issues, about how we deal with that. How do we interact with these former liberation forces? And it'd be interesting to hear your views on some of that. But just in closing, I'll just say that the, the African Revolution is absolutely still solid. As you said, you can't kill ideas. You can't kill the basic contradiction. The basic contradiction is still there between labor and capital. In Africa, we would argue that the, the, the term working class can be broadly said, yes, in Africa that's true, but we also add the word peasant, and the reason why we add that is because in many parts of Asia, Latin America, and Africa, the majority of the people are not workers. The majority of people don't, have work, don't actually go to work and earn a, a salary. What they do is they're subsistence farmers, or they live off the back of other family members. So the, the kind of industrial working class, the proletariat in that traditional sense, what you have in Europe, you don't have in these countries. And if you look at the revolutions in these countries, they've been peasant-led, or, or working class and peasant uh, combinations. So again, there's some interesting challenges for us. So hopefully we can continue that debate, and our solidarity is absolutely solid with yourselves. And I'd uh, just like to say thank you again for, for inviting us, and keep up all the fantastic work.